All right, well, you guys get the, uh, the hidden secrets of Project 2. All right, let's get going. So just let me start off with a quick recap. Project one was about query evaluation. And we went through this whole process of, uh, or at least I encouraged you to go through this whole process of creating a relational algebra plan for, your, uh, for the queries that you were given, and then evaluating that plan uh, through the iterator model. Now, this evaluating SQL directly is already kind of, uh, of a pain in the butt, so this uh, helps you out a little bit. But where, this, uh, where the use of relational algebra really, really pays off uh, is in uh, this project, because this is where you make everything fast. So starting off with this kind of high-level view, uh, the, the main addition that will get you the, the, that will essentially get you an A grade in, um, in project two is the addition of an optimizer. I mean, there's a bunch of different ways of, of achieving this, but uh, the simplest way of um, changing your code from project one is to add an optimizer that rebuilds this relational algebra tree into a more efficient one. So, just to give you uh, an idea of what to expect, there are basically going to be two phases in this project. And the first, uh, I need to learn that that projector sucks. Um, the, first project, the first phase is going to be literally identical. Same exact thing, you're gonna get more queries, uh, more queries with joins, um, but the basic interface is going to be uh, completely identical. The only major difference is that the time constraints are now going to be smaller. Um, and more importantly, you're going to be getting many, many more joins. So uh, main change that needs to happen here is that you need to start using um, specialized join algorithms like hash join or sort merge join rather than um, the, the default nested loop join. Phase two, you're going to uh, have one additional constraint, which is the amount of memory that you have to work with. So the timing, the time constraints are going to be a little bit different, uh, a little bit looser, but you're going to get this argument dash dash swap. Um, and this is going to give you the, a path to a directory that is guaranteed to be uh, unique uh, and empty every single time, not unique, but it's guaranteed to be empty every single time that uh, one trial is run. Um, so this is basically a directory where, where you can put temporary files that will get erased immediately after your, uh, your code runs. So the other difference is that there's going to be an explicit memory limit. So Java has a feature where you can limit the heap size. I will be using this to limit how much uh, memory your code has access to. And uh, while this may change, the specs aren't completely finalized. It's looking like this is going to be somewhere around 200 megabytes. So essentially allocating any more than uh, 50 megabytes of, uh, 50 to 100 megabytes of uh, buffer space is not going to work. Well, not going to work efficiently. Any questions on the high-level spec? And I'll have a, a formal, uh, a more precise uh, spec, just like for checkpoint one, posted hopefully by Monday. Uh, the size of the data files will most likely be somewhere on the order of uh, a gigabyte unparsed. Uh, in other words, uh, in their raw text format, uh, we'll be using a TPCH scaling factor one database, which in total is approximately one gigabyte uh, in text format. Uh, once you start turning the integer uh, strings into integers and so forth, you can probably get that down by an order of magnitude or so, but well, actually, you can probably get that down quite a bit, but um, most likely you'll have about a, hun um, a one gigabyte data set to work with. And 
There's no size limitation. Well, I mean, modulo how much the hard disk uh, of the grading machines has. Uh, basically, as long as you keep it under, uh, you, you will have at least uh, a couple hundred gigabytes to work with. So yes, in, in a practical sense, but in, in sorry, yes, yes, but not in a practical sense. Yeah. No, um, the swap folder will get deleted and recreated. No, uh, that's how much memory you have in heap uh, in your heap. So you can't allocate. Java will not let you allocate more than a hundred megabytes. Uh, uh, excuse me, two hundred megabytes of memory at any given time. And uh, just so, uh, just to be. Uh, precise about this, Java performance tends to degrade pretty horrifically if you use more than half of the available heap space. So in practice, don't allocate more than 100 megabytes of, uh, of state. Yeah, so if, uh, if, Java, if Java has less than half of its memory available to it, it'll run the garbage collection way more aggressively than it otherwise would. So that will lead to major performance issues. I would personally try and keep it to 10 to 50 megabytes for any given operation. Any other questions? Um, you will not get, so Java doesn't have any, uh, I'm not aware of any facility that Java gives you to tell you, hmm. I am actually not, not sure. Um, Java might have a feature that lets you get uh, how much memory is currently allocated. Uh, it's certainly, the, the runtime certainly has that information. I don't know whether it makes that information available to the, the client code. Um, I will find that, that out. Uh, please post it on Piazza, and I'll, uh, I'll find that out and uh, re respond on, yeah. Uh, I know Eclipse does. There's a couple of um, of tools. JProf has a memory L or a feature. I think it's called JProf. Um, again, that that is a great question that I don't immediately have the answer to. But if you post it on Piazza, I can uh, put up some pointers. Any other questions? The swap space is, for all practical purposes, as big as you need it to be. Um, realistically, the hard drives are, I think, 500 megabyte hard drives, or sorry, 500 gigabyte hard drives. So if you start getting close to 500 gigabytes, uh, your program will fail. But by the time, realistically, you shouldn't need that much. And if you do, something is going wrong. Yeah. Oh, um, you can mostly ignore that. That's mostly for testing purposes. Uh, but there's a uh, there's a logging framework called JUnit that is being linked again. Uh, that is part of the libraries. Uh, that's mostly for testing purposes. But if you want to, let me actually. I, that might actually be useful. Um, I'll post uh, I'll post links to that in project two as well. Um, simply, uh, it's a way of turning on and off logging functionality easily. The question is, uh, uh, so the swap will be emptied after every single uh, run. Yes, you don't need to manually empty it. So we're going to, going to run your code one execution per query. And every time you finish 
running, uh, every time you, your code exits, will empty out the swap folder. Oh, that's for the entire run of one uh, Yeah. For uh, the entire run of one query. So we'll uh, Java TPCH1, empty the swap. Java TPCH2, empty the swap, and so forth. Any other questions? All right. So the, really the, the main, uh, there are two main challenges to this uh, project. And the first is dealing with uh, limited memory. And the second is uh, optimizing your code to run fast. Uh, to take advantage of op specialized join uh, operators, to take advantage of uh, more, uh, to rewrite the query so that even on fairly complex queries, you get good performance. So just to recap, the simplest way of restructuring your code, and this is where uh, this is where using relational algebra trees pays off. The simplest way is to be able to identify certain patterns in your relational algebra tree that can be replaced with other patterns. So like I have this uh, query here that uh, you know, simple three-way join. Um, and the way I've been encouraging everyone to, pr uh, to output that uh, query, is, or to, sorry, to translate that query into relational algebra tree is in this basic structure where you have uh, some nested loop joins or cross products, a selection and a projection. Really straightforward. Um, now there's a couple of places in this tree and this is exactly the example that uh, we went over with uh, optimization. Um, there's some places in this tree where there's obvious ways that you can rewrite it. So for example, I can take this uh, massive selection and I can break it down into two chunks. Uh, one chunk that I can push down through the cross product and one chunk that I can't. Um, and so I might take that chunk, I might then push it down um, because that's another equivalence that I can use. Um, and I can keep doing this. I can keep finding certain patterns in the tree, uh, replacing them with different equivalent uh, subtrees, and eventually I converge to a uh, representation of the query that is uh, potentially quite a bit more efficient. And we keep doing that and eventually converge to a representation that is much more efficient. So this is the basic pattern that I'm going to recommend that you take uh, for project two. You look at your relational algebra tree, you traverse the tree, and you find instances of um, specific patterns that make sense to apply. Um, or excuse me, specific patterns that indicate that there's a, po a potential optimization that you can perform. Um, if the, the pattern gets matched, apply whatever optimization uh, the pattern corresponds to, and you keep repeating this process uh, as long as is necessary. And we'll talk about uh, how, how much you need to repeat later on. <coughs> okay. So the reference implementation, um, at, its, at the heart of its optimizer, and does a couple of other uh, weird gimmicky things that I'll, I'll talk about a little bit later, but the heart of it, the, the really kind of, uh, the optimizations that provide the biggest bang for the buck, um, there are really three optimizations that it does. Um, pushing down selections, because the earlier you can filter out rows, the better. And TPCH is full of these cases where uh, there are selections on single attributes in single columns that you can push down all the way. Um, one call, uh, one where you uh, build uh, the actual join. So you take the selection plus a cross product, turn that into a join. And one optional optimization or one optimization that gets activated when dash dash swap gets passed as a command line argument, uh, which is to take every single operation that has an unbounded Oh, that uses an unbounded amount of memory and replaces it with uh, the equivalent uh, sort merge uh, variant. 
excuse me, the, the equivalent variant uh, that uses a constant amount of memory uh, plus this on disk sort operator. We'll talk about that one uh, a little bit later. But these are kind of the, the simple things that you can do that will get you 90% of the way to, um, to the performance of the reference implementation. Basically, if you implement these two, uh, unless there are some major slowdowns elsewhere in your code, this is basically uh, this, implementing this correctly uh, gets you, will get you to a performance that uh, will get you to an A level, uh, to, will get you the full five points on performance. So let's talk about these optimizations. Um, the first one is pushing down selections. So the, the basic structure of this, this is going to be a little more complex than, um, than kind of the simple selection push down optimization that we talked about previously. But the simple form of this is that if you have a selection operator, you break it up into three chunks. Uh, the one chunk that applies to the left hand, excuse me, if you have a selection operator sitting on top of a cross product operator, then you break the, the selection condition up into three chunks. Uh, the chunk that applies to the left hand side, the chunk that applies to the right hand side, and the chunk that applies to both. And then you take the two chunks that you can push down and you push them down. So how do we go about doing this? So first off, what do we need to do to identify uh, situations where this optimization could be uh, potentially applicable? Uh, could you speak up? Okay, so we need to figure out that there is a selection sitting on top of a cross product. Great, so how would you go about doing that? Great. So you visit every node in the tree and you test to see if one of those operators uh, is a selection. And anytime you see a selection, well, you check to see if its child is a cross product. Um, this code is very approximate because everyone implemented their own version of this. But many of you essentially implemented something that allows you to look at uh, not just the operators, but the operators, uh, uh, the, the children in the tree. So in this case, if you have a selection operator sitting on top of a cross product operator, then you figure out, uh, well, that's the pattern. You now have a selection operator and the selection operator's child, which is a cross product, that allows you to um, essentially reconstruct everything that it is that you want to reconstruct. Um, and of course, you want to be able to do this to every single node in the tree. So you're going to have to have presumably some piece of code that takes that optimization or that pattern matching and looks at every single or scours the entire uh, region that you have uh, potentially, uh, that you're potentially interested in, uh, looks over every single part of the, the relational algebra tree. Uh, I figured simple representation of this would be uh, kind of you basically scan over the entire tree, look at every single uh, every single node in the tree, and eventually you find the one uh, that uh, corresponds to the, the substructure that you're looking for. Um, so in this case, I have a selection sitting on top of a cross product. So I'm going to apply the rewrite. Um, and my little selection predicate there is going to run away from me. Obviously, it's a big, giant, scary eye. Why wouldn't it want to run away? Um, so it'll continue traversing the tree, looking at different parts of the tree until it finds another instance of uh, what it's looking for. And it just keeps doing this until it uh, keeps scanning through the entire tree, looking for instances of the pattern uh, that it can uh, apply the rewrite to. OK, top-down optimization. Um, essentially requires you to have some sort of recursive traversal of the tree and some sort of way of uh, rewriting specific nodes. Any questions on this basic process? Just the idea of uh, pattern matching and scanning through the entire tree for patterns. Yeah, so I mean, essentially what, uh, 
let me back up here, uh, start at the very top. And if that matches the pattern, great, rewrite it. If not, recur to its child, or repeat the process on its child. Uh, if that matches the pattern, great, rewrite the tree, start back from the node that replaced it, and uh, keep scanning, uh, keep recursively descending down the tree until you find, uh, until you visit all of the nodes. And every time you find one that is a candidate for replacement, you replace it. That's what I meant. Does that answer your question? Yeah? So pattern, um, by a pattern I mean a, uh, a combination, a, a specific subtree with, uh, oh, that's a great question. Um, so what, what am I looking for here? I'm looking for a selection operator sitting on top of a cross product operator. I don't necessarily care about what the children of the cross product operator are, and I don't necessarily care about what the parent of the selection operator is. I don't even uh, care initially when I'm just doing this uh, initial pattern matching. Um, or, I use the term pattern. I don't care initially even what the condition is. So all I'm looking for is a selection operator sitting on top of a cross product operator. That's a pattern. So basically that. Yeah. Well, so you, you need to know what the children are, but you don't need to, uh, excuse me, you need to know uh, that the children exist, and you need to have some reference to the children, but as far as you're concerned, they're completely black boxes at this point. Um, I can replace whatever is in those black box, or I, excuse me, I can, as long as I have a pointer to that black box, I don't care what's in it, because uh, when I, uh, here we go. Oh, the one time, there we go. So if I have a selection sitting on top of a cross product sitting on top of R, S, I have R and S. They could be subtrees, they could be relations. I, I do not care because eventually what I'm going to end up with is something that looks like that. Whatever operator happens to be sitting here goes directly into the new tree. I don't mess with it, I don't touch it, I don't, it, I don't even care how it looks like. So th um, that's what I meant, that uh, you, you do need to know that it exists, it's part of the pattern, but the content doesn't matter. You don't care what it is. Yeah. You can keep going until you hit the leaves. Or, well, we'll talk a little bit more about how, uh, how you do this, but the simple, uh, the simple process is start top down and, let me back that up. The simple process is either start top down, go down to the leaves, or start at the leaves and go up. And which of those depends on what kind of transformation you're performing because certain kinds of transformations push things down into the tree and other transformations push things up in the tree. Uh, the simple ones all push things down. So top down works. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh, uh, good point. Thank you for reminding me. Uh, so while it's not necessarily applicable in this case because the selection operator doesn't change anything in the schema, uh, certain optimizations that we'll uh, briefly touch on towards the end of the class require, uh, might change the schema of your, uh, might change the schema of uh, one of the relations that you're working with. So for, uh, for example, if I'm pushing down a projection operator, uh, that projection operator is going to change the schema. If I uh, 
switch the order of joins. That's another one that will probably start being relevant in the next, uh, in the next project. Um, if I switch the order of the joins, you may be producing schema uh, tuples that, where the attribute order is, is flipped. Um, the reason I bring this up is that a number of, uh, a number of the, uh, the projects that I looked at had um, hard-coded schema definitions in the relational algebra tree. Uh, sorry, not hard-coded, um, cached, uh, essentially cached the, the schema of every relational algebra operator in the relational algebra, uh, the object representing uh, a given relational algebra operator. Um, that's fine, but just be aware of it because every time I change, uh, every time I change anything in my relational algebra tree, it's possible that that schema might change. So be aware and make sure you recache the schema every time you uh, change the tree in some way. Or rebuild the schema if you're doing that. Does that address your concern? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, you you're skipping. Uh, let me. Well, uh, where is it? yeah. So the simple formulation of this is that you take this one pattern and you replace it with this pattern, and this pattern. Uh, The, con the part of the condition that applies to R goes here, and we'll, uh, I'll, I've got a couple of slides on how you compute these, but the, the part uh, that applies to R goes on the left-hand side, the part that applies to uh, S goes on the right-hand side, and the part that applies to both, uh, you can't push it down, obviously. Does that answer your question? Okay. Uh, uh, skip ahead. Okay, so the other thing you need to be aware of with respect to, uh, to this selection pushdown operation is uh, conjunctive clauses. So you're not actually going to, in general, want to pick one clause and push down one clause at a time. Um, if you have a selection, uh, selection predicate sitting on top of a cross product, just break it up excuse me, break it all up into in one go. And the way to do that is to recognize that a, a set of conjunctions, or a, an A and B and C, uh, essentially is just another tree. It's another tree structure. So uh, if I take, you know, I could potentially re represent that that way. Um, and in JSQL parser or JSQL parser's expression class, this is essentially represented by an and expression. And okay, so I've got this and I want to find out which clauses go on the left hand side, which set of clauses go on the center, which set of clauses go on the right. Uh, what do I need to do? Hmm. Yeah, so you traverse the tree, you find all of the clauses, and um, build a list of them. Once you have a list, you just iterate over the list and find the ones uh, that belong on the left, the ones that belong on the right. Um, and here's some code. I uh, actually posted this, or we'll post this on the, the project right up when it goes up. Um, but I mean, simple, recurs uh, simple bit of recursion. Go through the clauses. If you have an AND expression, well, you combine the two lists that you get from its children. Uh, if it's not an AND expression, well, it's a single element list. Yeah? Well, a uh, simple example here. Um, All right, 
Here we go. So I've got RB equals SB, SC equals uh, SC is less than 5, SD is equal TD. Now, that's a list of equality constraints, right? Uh, except here, it's not in list form. It, uh, excuse me, not here. The output of JSQL parser is going to be a tree of AND expressions. And what I am simply pointing out here, apologies if this is uh, obvious or, or uh, you need to be able to convert that to a list. Uh, because I don't necessarily have any guarantees that the entire expression is going to be pushed down to one side or the other. So in this case, I need to, ex at the very least, split it up into RB equals SB, which stays in place, and SC in, uh, is less than 5, SD equals TD, which goes uh, to one side. Uh, does that address your concern? Uh, yeah. Um, just, uh, so the question is, uh, will selection predicates always be in conjunctive normal form? And that's a great question. Uh, in fact, I believe there's actually one query where it isn't. Um, so that's a great question. Um, you may find some advantage uh, of converting to conjunctive normal form. I would consider that as another optimization on top of uh, what's happening here. Uh, question? Same question, okay. So the short answer, you're not guaranteed to get them in conjunctive normal form, although realistically in practice, most of the queries will, will be in just a, con uh, a conjunction of clauses or happens very rare, rarely. This is, by the way, uh, another advantage of kind of having this default representation. Um, coming up with a relational algebra expression that captures the basic idea and gets it right means that you can accept every single possible query that comes your way while also giving you the flexibility to kind of progressively uh, improve the performance of your code for common cases. Like, you can get 90% of all, well, I'm pulling this number out of my, my, uh, my this is a random number, but uh, like n the vast majority of all queries that you're going to encounter both here and in most practical applications are essentially just A and B and C and D and, and you know, give me all of the things that are this, 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 and this. Um, it's just a very common case. Whereas ORs are kind of usually nested, people think in conjunctive normal form when writing queries. So you don't necessarily need to construct conjunctive normal form queries and you'd still get you'd still perform well in most cases. So this kind of representation gives you just a huge amount of flexibility. In, in, uh, okay, so convert all of your, uh, convert the expression uh, that represents a, a list of uh, conjunct conjunctive clauses uh, into a list, push everything, uh, figure out which elements of the list go to the left, figure out which elements go to the right, and split it up three ways. Okay, any questions uh, about pushing down selection through cross product? Or any additional questions I should ask? Yeah. Ah, that's a great question. So the question is, how do I determine uh, which side I can push down a particular clause on if you don't know anything about, uh, about that child? The short version is, I lied. 
Um, and that's actually a great uh, point. So I don't need to know necessarily how R is constructed, but I do need to know some information about it. Uh, specifically, I need to know its schema, what columns appear in, uh, on either side. If I have that, I don't necessarily need to know how that schema is constructed, but if I know what the, the set of column names that appear in, in that, uh, on that side are, then I can, I can figure, th figure this out. Does that address your? Will there be in, uh, the question is, will there be instances where you can push projections down below operators as well? Uh, yeah, that's actually one of the optimizations that I have in my uh, suggested list of optional optimizations uh, towards the end. Uh, Uh, so the question is, what if it's a join? Um, so even for a join, I can still compute the schema of, I, I still can compute what the output of that join would be. I mean, it's, uh, the output of a join is essentially the schema of the left-hand side plus the schema of the right-hand side, or concatenated with the schema of the right-hand side. Or, well, does that address your question? Uh, in other words, what I'm recommending, if you haven't already done so, and many of you already have, uh, each, opera each uh, operator in your relational algebra representation should be able to compute the schema of its children. Or, sorry, the schema of its own, uh, of itself, based on the schema of its children. Yeah. Um, the queries in project two will be, will follow the same spec as project one. Um, they will have more joins, but they'll follow the same basic spec. Uh, no natural, all of the joins will be simple joins. Uh, no, but that actually leads to another suggested, another rewrite, which is build the joins. Um, you can actually do this as part of the selection uh, rewrites. I chose to separate it out because it uh, makes things easier. The selection code is already fairly complex, um, but you can essentially incorporate those two. Uh, before I get to that, I just want to do uh, one other uh, mention. There are some cases, although not many, where it is advantageous to push selections down through projections as well. And this is a little more tricky because you actually need to uh, rewrite the selection condition. So the selection condition refers to columns constructed by the projection operator. Now, if you want to, you can kind of manually traverse that entire tree, and every time you see a column in the selection predicate, the selection condition, you replace that column with the corresponding expression from the projection operator. This is purely optional. If you want to do it, it there are one or two cases where, where it'll give you a performance boost, but it's, it's purely optional. Yeah. Sure. Uh, the question is, uh, can I explain this with an example? Yeah, it's easier to erase. Oh, don't even need to erase. Uh, so let's say I have a selection for a is less than 2, and B is equal to C. And that's sitting on top of a projection operator for, um, I don't know, A equals uh, R dot um, 
m plus 2. Uh, b is equal to r dot b. And c is equal to 2 times s dot b. Okay. So recall, each of these are um, expression objects. And each of these are essentially, call, uh, at least based on what you are getting from uh, JSQL parser, this essentially amounts to a list of select expression items. And a select expression item is a, list, is a pair of a column and an expression. You may have done some optimizations, but this is essentially what you're getting. So I'm going to assume that that's what you're using. Uh, if you don't know how to, if you aren't uh, sure how to map that to your implementation, uh, then I'd be happy to talk about it. Um, but the thing is that this is also an expression. So it's an expression that looks like um, and of less than of a two and equals of b and c. Can everyone see that? So the projection operator changes the schema. Uh, I'm going to need more space for that. So, uh, The projection operator changes the schema, which means that if I swap the order of those two, A, B, and C are no longer defined. And even, even if they are defined, they're no longer defined in a way that uh, makes sense. Uh, let's call that S dot C. C is still defined, but it now has a new value. So, the way you would go about doing this is to essentially traverse this expression tree, find every instance of a column, and replace that column with the corresponding expression from the projection operator. So this would be plus r dot m two r dot b and times two s dot c. So this is just that, this is that, and this subtree is that. I'm literally just going through, and everywhere I see an A, I'm replacing it with, uh, plus two, uh, with the expression corresponding to A. Like I said, this is optional. Uh, there are one or two places where it'll provide a performance benefit, uh, but it's, it's purely optional. Hmm? Sorry? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, eraser. So this expression would get rewritten into this expression, uh, where the condition in the new selection predicate is basically obtained by replacing every uh, 
variable in the original selection predicate with the corresponding uh, value defined by, or the corresponding expression defined by the projection operator. Does that address your concern? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so the projection remains unchanged. The sele uh, selection doesn't change anything in the projection operator. Um, uh, sorry, it doesn't change the schema. All right. Any other questions? All right. Sorry? Uh, how is pushing the selection down through the projection? So the pulling the projection up doesn't necessarily help, but pushing the selection down opens up new opportunities. Uh, so the simple example of where this would be useful is if you have a subquery. So if I have a selection predicate that applies to a subquery, that subquery might have a projection operator sitting around it. And this allows me to push the selection uh, down into the subquery. If, and like I said, I, there's one or two queries where this might help. Anyway, the, I wanted to bring that up mainly because it's another simple, somewhat simple optimization you can do. Um, I wouldn't put that on the top of the, the to-do list, though. Okay, so uh, joins, same deal. You're looking for patterns of selection predicates sitting on top of cross products. And if there's any, uh, any clause in there that um, has, uh, that is an equals, well, you potentially have your join condition right there. Um, yeah. Uh, what the reference implementation does is essentially look for any instance of a, uh, it does the same kind of, it, it'll break the clauses down in the same way that uh, the previous operation did, and then it'll, it will look for a clause that is an equals operation with where one side comes from one relation, the other side comes from the other, excuse me, not, comes from one input, the other side uh, comes from the other input, and then it builds a hash join based on that equality predicate. Um, same basic deal. Find the selection uh, sitting on top of a cross product, find a clause that works, and build a hash join out of it. Uh, you can do something more complex here. Uh, students have uh, done some really clever things last year, um, but this will get you 90%, well, this will get you pretty much everything you need. Any questions on building joins? Yeah. Uh, select, uh, sorry, the, the uh, equality here, the equivalence here is selection sitting on top of a cross product is equal to a join. Um, so yeah, special, uh, basically turning cross products into joins based on the selection product, uh, sele selection condition sitting on top of it. Okay, um, so if you're called with uh, dash dash swap, you're only going to get 200 megabytes of heap, of which about 100 megabytes is actually usable. Um, this essentially means that grace hash, hash join, which I would recommend using for part one, uh, is no longer an option. And it also means that uh, group by operator uh, is no longer an option either. So uh, I would recommend implementing two new operators, uh, one to do uh, group by on sorted lists, one to do merges on sorted lists, uh, sorry, merge join on sorted lists. Uh, and I would implement a two-way sort operator, uh, where two-way sort is the simple sort, uh, the simple sort algorithm that we talked about last week. Um, and then you can replace everywhere that there is a group by operator in your tree, you can replace it with a sorted group by plus a sort. Same thing from anywhere you have a hash join. And this is what the, or, this is what the reference implementation does. It'll do another optimization pass where it finds, the pattern is even simpler. The pattern is just, there is a group by operator. And then it will replace that uh, instances of that pattern with, uh, with sorted group by, sort plus group by. 
Uh, we are out of time, so I'm not going to recap two-way sort. Um, if there are any questions on that, I'd be happy to answer them on Piazza or, um, or next lecture. Uh, one other thing I want to, or two other things I want to get across before we end. Um, a couple of other op optimizations that you might consider doing that'll kind of bump up uh, performance even more. Uh, one is to partially evaluate expressions. Um, so eval right now will evaluate an entire expression to a constant value, but you may get some benefit, especially if you're pushing selections through projections uh, of partially evaluating. In other words, if there's some sub-expression uh, that you can evaluate, try and eval uh, replace 1 plus 2, for example, with uh, just, with just uh, 3. Um, I'd be happy to talk about that offline. Uh, pushing down projections, so there's some advantages that you can get by uh, not having, th this actually got a lot of people uh, quite a bit of performance boost last year. Um, if you can figure out that certain attributes aren't necessary when you read them out of the data file, then you can avoid calling uh, string, uh, calling uh, parse long or parse float, both of which are comparatively expensive operations. So if you can figure out which attributes aren't necessary, that's a great way. Pushing projections down is a great way to, to limit the amount of work that your relation scan, that your table scan operator needs to do. Um, there's also some gains that you could potentially get by reordering joins. Uh, I talked to a few, about, a few of you about this. Um, that uh, for some of the TPCH queries, the order of the joins actually uh, matters quite a bit. Um, unfortunately, there's not really much you can do here uh, without additional statistics about the data, uh, so we'll get into that in the coming lectures. Last thing I just want to briefly cover, uh, when do you stop optimizing? If you have a reasonably clever order over the optimization rules that you have, and this is what the reference implementation does, you can just apply each of them once to every single node of the tree. Ordering is extremely important if you do that. So be aware of what order to do it, uh, but you can get away with applying it just once. Um, a couple of other, other tricks, you can apply them some arbitrary number of times, uh, and if you take n to an extreme, you can keep applying them until uh, applying optimizations no longer changes the relational al algebra tree. And that's typically what a relational op algebra optimizer will do. Um, or if you pass dash 03 to, to uh, GCC or uh, Java C, that's what it will essentially do. It'll keep doing it until it can't optimize anything else. Any final questions? Great. Uh, sorry for keeping you a little bit over. Um, Good luck, and I'll have uh, things posted on uh, precise spec posted on Monday.